Um, so this is the, uh, the next session of biomechanics of injury and prevention. And we are looking today, um, this afternoon, at the head, neck, and spine, um, and also the upper limb, but this morning looking at the lower limb. Uh, and again, thanks to uh, Jeanne and Dr. Jitendra for making all this happen. Okay, so the lower limb, most of which we've described in uh, detail, or in some detail already, we'll, we'll look at it in, in greater detail this morning. Um, we have the femoral head, so the femur is the, the large thigh bone. Um, at the top we have a femoral head, which comprises one part of our hip joint, and that fits into the, um, the acetabulum cup, and that is um, located on the pelvis. Both the acetabulum and the femoral head are covered in articular cartilage. Um, so we have articular cartilage, which we're now more familiar with. So by now we know that this is our femoral head. This stretches down at the bottom, so we have um, the shaft of our long bone, and then we have the condyles at the bottom. And we have a big gap in the middle of the long bone, which is our canal. And so the femoral head sits within the acetabulum of the pelvis, and both surfaces are lined by articular cartilage. So it's a smooth layer of articular cartilage inside it, and the two are then um, held in place uh, with a ligament that effectively links the, the ball and the socket together. At the other end, we have our condyle, so that's our knee joint at the bottom, which are quite distinctive in terms of their shape, and then they, they sit on top of the, the tibia uh, and the flat section of the tibia. The fibula is the thinner leg, uh, thinner bone of the lower leg. That's on the outside, uh, and the reason that there are two bones in the lower leg is to enable rotation um, in the ankle joint. The fibula doesn't actually contact the, the femur. The fibula and the tibia are linked together at the top in the distal, uh, in the proximal um, tibiofemoral joint, and also the distal tibiofemoral joint as well. The fibula and the talus also form the predominant joint within the ankle. So here we've got two new terms, distal being the distance joint, proximal being the nearer joint. So proximal tibiofibular uh, joint is here, distal tibiofibular joint is there. So here again, we see a slightly more accurate version of my picture. Um, so we see our intermedullary canal starting here. That's where the bone marrow is stored. We see our cancellous bone, which is, although this is a picture, should be better aligned in terms of the direction of principal strains. So they would uh, come this way. Um, the greater trochanter, which is an insertion site for um, other soft tissues, and then we can just about see the, the ligament that keeps or that assists in keeping the femoral head in place. There are other ligaments that ensure the femur is, is locked into uh, the pelvis. When it comes to what engineers become involved in, as we've described earlier, um, one of the main interventions that engineers influence in the hip is a hip replacement. 
That happens in a number of different ways, one of which is that the articular cartilage surface can be resurfaced. And so that is whereby the traditional hip replacement effectively removes the entire femoral head. Hip resurfacing is um, almost like an upside down bowl that fits on top of the femoral head. So you're covering the old articular cartilage, which is degrading, causing osteoarthritis, with a, in 2D, something that effectively looks like that. And so it sits on top of the femoral head. That is effectively stage one in, in a revision. So you would try and avoid doing a, an entire total hip replacement by removing this femur. By then inserting a stem and attaching a new head. You would avoid doing that for as long as possible. We've said before on a number of occasions now, these replacements last about 20 years at a, an absolute upper limit at this stage. Certainly in the, the Western world, and, and no doubt uh, over here as well, one of the problems that we're seeing is that um, active patients or obese patients who generally wear out their joints earlier than what has historically happened means that they require a replacement sooner. But people are also living longer, and so the gap between when you have your replacement to ultimately when you die is increasing, and, and it's increasing beyond 20 years insofar as if you need a replacement at 60 and you're likely to die at 85, 90, then this isn't going to be sufficient. And so it's driving engineers to come up with um, interim measures, interim solutions that avoids this or delays this um, process from happening. The problem here is that when our implant run, um, wears out and it needs replacing, removing the femoral stem from the femur is very difficult. Um, one of the key design requirements of a femoral stem is that it integrates into the bone. There has to be minimal, if not zero, movement of the femoral head because the design of the interface between the, the replacement femoral head and the acetabulum cup is very tight. So you've got very tight um, design constraints or dimension constraints. If this then starts wobbling around, then this will fail sooner. We designed this such that there is a very narrow tolerance. Um, we need that narrow tolerance so that we can encourage the best type of lubrication, which means that if this is anything other than um, firmly fixed into the, the femoral um, shaft, then you're not going to have the clearance and you're not going to be able to maintain those fine tolerances. The downside, so the good thing is that you can cover this in coatings. So the coatings will encourage the bone to grow onto it. You can add cement. You can have collars here that, that um, add stability. So there are various design um, uh, additions that you can uh, integrate into your um, final concept. But all of them are to encourage bone growth. The problem that a surgeon will have is if this wears out, how do you get the whole lot back out again? It's had 15 or 20 years of bone growing onto the implant. You then need to take it back out and then create some space for a new one to go in. One system that has limitations is that they can make the stem modular. So effectively, you can have the stem there, and then you can just replace the femoral head. One of the issues with that is that you get movement between the femoral head and the stem, um, because unless you have such a, it's very difficult to get a fit that is, that is perfect, that doesn't move at all, because you can't have movement up here, as you've just described. But if you don't have some degree of movement, then it's very difficult to get the head off as well. And so this is a, a real challenge that we're facing at the minute, is how do you uh, create a, an implant that is functionally um, as good as possible, such that you do have an opportunity to reach 20 years, but then gives the surgeon a chance of getting it back out again so that it can be replaced when the patient um, needs a revision. So these are some of the challenges that engineers um, are faced looking at the lower limb. Similar problems too for the knee. Um, we would do a, a uni compartmental uh, resurfacing. So we have two um, condyles, two compartments. Where there is wear on one side as opposed to the other, 
then you would look to uh, replace the articular cartilage on one side of uh, the knee in the first instance to try and buy more time um, such that the, the full knee replacement can be done some years further down the line. Uh, and again, it's very much a time constraint. You're trying to uh, ensure that the, um, the full replacement happens as late in life as possible, such that you only need to do that once. We know already that the knee has four ligaments. Here we're looking at a right knee because that's our medial, our near center um, lateral collateral ligament. Uh, sorry, uh, collateral ligament. Here we have the lateral collateral lig ligament, which is on the outside. And we have these two moon-shaped menisci that help support um, the, t uh, the, the femoral condyles as they sit on the tibial plateau. Looking from the side again, we have our articular cartilage. That's surrounded by synovium, so a, a, this watertight membrane, uh, and the kneecap. Um, <sighs> The origins of the kneecap is somewhat unclear. Two potential um, reasons for its evolution, one of which is that this is effectively a bone that's formed um, by the, the tendon becoming uh, very hard. Um, so we discussed on Monday or Tuesday about the ankle joint and how when tendons rub over a bony pulley in the ankle, it forms a harder, um, stiffer material. It could well be that this is what's happened here. So this is the patella tendon, um, attaches onto muscles in the, the upper leg, inserts onto the um, proximal end of the tibia. But it rubs over the um, femoral condyles. So maybe this rubbing over time has caused this part of the, the, the tendon to ossify, to become bony. Another reason is that it increases the lever arm and so the effectiveness of the tendon. Effectively creating a bony pulley or a pulley in an engineering term, such that the, the pull from the muscle from this way is more effective at extending the knee um, back into to full extension. Again, the, the patella, the kneecap, has um, a cartilage lining such that when it slides over the uh, femoral condyles of the knee, then it causes minimal disruption. And we've heard previously how the knee is quite susceptible to injury, particularly to, to sports injury. If you're someone who gets a knee injury in, in earlier kind of phases of life, um, and there are Instances, relatively common instances, of the, the ligaments that cross in the middle, um, one of those rupturing. Um, less obvious and less common is an injury to the um, outer ligaments, the lateral or the medial collateral ligaments. Given that we've touched on the knee and the hip to um, quite a, an extensive degree thus far, um, this morning we're going to focus predominantly on the ankle. Um, the ankle is a strange one. It's not currently an area of established um, orthopedic science. Um, you look at the major intervention from engineers and it's very much the hip and uh, the knee. Um, there is um, activity happening uh, in the UK and further afield as well about how we start to look to replace the ankle. Whilst Either obesity or sports or a combination of the two is uh, fueling a rise in a hip and knee surgery. Um, the biomechanics that cause um, or that drive the demand for those um, other surgeries are also going to be um, underpinning the premature failure of the, <clears throat> the ankle joint too. If the knee and the hip are exposed to greater loads, then there's no reason why the ankle wouldn't be too. And so engineers becoming involved in designing new ankle replacements is an emerging field of activity, um, but one that is um, without doubt happening. And it's a complex joint. We have um, the tibia, so the bottom of our, um, of the main bone of our lower leg. That interfaces with the talus. That's the, the skinny outer bone of the lower leg, the fibula. That too 
interfaces uh, with the talus. And here we have the calcaneal bone that we sketched yesterday. The Achilles tendon runs down here and inserts onto that. So they're the three bones of the ankle. Um, this is the largest bone in the foot. Um, not one that we really need to be too concerned about because a lot of the load is distributed up here. But to give you um, some appreciation about where we are in, in the anatomy of the foot, then that is um, the calcaneus. So we've got three joints that comprise the ankle. Tibio talar, um, fibula talar, and then the tib fib joint uh, as well. And the two main directions of motion, we have the ability for the foot to come up, and so there's upward rotation, and there's downward uh, rotation too. But there are um, other axes of, of interest as well. And if we were to do this, uh, and if you were an enthusiastic bunch of undergrads, perhaps it would make you um, rise to the challenge, uh, but as, as perhaps you're not, um, then we can get people to put their fingers either side of their, of their ankle. You've got two reference points that stick out, the lateral and medial malleolus, so that's quite useful. And then we go through um, the range of obvious motion of the ankle. And you'd find that in the neutral position, so as I'm stood now in, with 90 degrees, that if you have your fingers either side of your ankle joint, they would be pretty much level. But as you go to dorsiflexion, as you pull your toes upwards, you will see that on the lateral edge, on the outer edge, your hand becomes lower than the inner edge. So the, the um, point of rotation, the centroid of rotation, actually changes when you go from neutral to dorsiflexion. Equally going to plantar flexion, when your toes point downwards, you have a similar thing happening as well. So the, the axis shifts the other way. So for an engineer to come in and design this, perhaps you would initially think of it being a simple hinge joint. And so you could have two metallic or a metallic and a plastic component um, with a, uh, some kind of pin through it such that it pivots. However, there would be a fundamental limitation to that because here we have evidence that it's not a simple hinge joint, it's not a simple pivot. And so were we to start with a relatively crude design whilst it would be functional to a point, it wouldn't give the subtle biomechanical adjustment that your ankle goes through um, as you go from dorsi, which is toes up, through to neutral, through to plantar flexion. So we can start to look at quite what position the foot is in as we go through the gait cycle. So that is to say, Whilst we recognize that the centroid of rotation changes as a foot goes from one position to another, in reality, how does that affect us or how would that affect us? And so here is um, a plot of, so dorsiflexion again, toes upwards, plantar toes downwards, and then we take that through the gait cycle. So this is looking at one leg as you go from your right leg being, or your left leg being stood up, uh, both your legs moving, and, and so effectively you take two steps forward. So just whilst you're taking two steps forward, you're focusing just on, on one leg. And so heel strike is your first step forward. So your heel has just hit the floor. And here we're saying that your foot is in an element of plantar flexion. And this plot is quite strange because the, the two actually differ. Both taken from reputable sources, but it highlights the degree of difference between people. And so here we're talking about heel strike, so heels just touch the floor, and here we're saying that there's an element of plantar flexion. This plot says there's nothing. So i.e. that we're in uh, neutral. We then move to a position of foot flat. So heel strike to foot flat, is effectively our foot flat on the floor. And at the point of foot being flat, you're not quite at the neutral position, 
but you're moving towards neutral and then you're going into to dorsiflexion. So the angle between your, um, the shank of your lower leg and your foot is actually closing. So that's not too dissimilar to what we're dealing with here. Heel off, and so when our heel comes off the floor, or heel rise as it's described there, both indicate some element of um, dorsiflexion. And then we go to toe off, which uh, we see there. And then we go to, to finally to heel strike again. So we can go through the phases of um, the gait cycle. So we go from about eight degrees of plantar flexion through foot flat, up into dorsiflexion, plantar flexion again, and then we have our heel strike. So that's one complete movement of um, one of our legs. Toe off to heel strike, our foot is effectively swinging through um, and our weight is being supported by our other leg. And so we have a position where our foot goes to neutral and then you prepare for heel strike again. So our foot goes into plantar flexion, ready for heel strike. So we can consider the, the loads going through um, the ankle, again by using a static analysis. And again, our tibia is here, here's our talus, our calcaneus, the black bit which is almost invisible is our Achilles tendon, and then this um, white um, fluorescent material is fat, so a lot of water within fat, and so it becomes um, quite apparent on um, the MR scans. This is the flexor hallucis longus, uh, that's a muscle. There you can see the tendon of the FHL disappears and actually goes out to the end of the foot um, and that serves to, to flex your big toe. So we can, as we did on, on Monday, we can do some uh, relatively simple free body diagrams to, to understand um, the joint reaction force at the tibio talar joint. And we can extend that out again to look at um, forces through the lower leg more generally, uh, looking at the knee um, as well. And we went through this uh, broadly on Monday, but to touch on it again, there are three elements that we need to consider when looking at uh, the lower leg. So here we're trying to estimate uh, the joint reaction force acting on the tibio femoral joint, so we're talking about the interface between the femur and the tibia. How much force is generated at that joint um, during stair climbing as a consequence of body weight? So we're doing nothing else, not carrying anything or doing anything, we're merely climbing upstairs. So how do you start to um, assess the amount of force generated in the, the knee um, as one would climb upstairs? And we know that there's body weight involved. The patella tendon, so the tendon that runs over the front of this knee. We want to know the force that's involved there. And that will enable us then to calculate the force that's going through the knee joint itself. And here we're presuming that someone has been frozen on the stairs, have stopped on the stairs, uh, because we're going to look at a static analysis. So the ground reaction force is actually this here. So if we were stood on some scales or an ability to measure the, the force that we're producing, then we know the direction and the magnitude of that. We know broadly the direction of our um, patella tendon force. We know the anatomy of the patella tendon and where it lies. 
um, and the, the angle that makes with the, uh, the knee joint itself. But we don't know the direction of this. We have no means of knowing the direction of force that goes through the knee joint. So because we know the directions of the patella tendon force and the force reacting from the ground, we know those two, but we don't know the joint reaction force. And so we can do some um, construction of vectors to enable us to work that out. We would have the um, size of the arrows being proportionate to the force that we're measuring. So we can get a direction and a magnitude of our joint reaction force. So again, why is that important? Why do we care about things like joint reaction forces? It comes back to concepts such as this. And ultimately driven by this. If this wasn't an issue, then there would be no reason for engineers to get involved in this anymore. So this is still uh, an issue. We still need implants, hips, knees, ankles that last longer than what they do. And so the more we know about the biomechanics of the healthy joint, the more we've got an opportunity to identify new materials as they become uh, available on the market, new manufacturing processes, um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing is an obvious one to, to look at currently. Can we combine those technologies to ensure that we can design interventions, which are relatively modern, the, the resurfacing is relatively new. Can we design interventions that are more effective at lasting longer than 20 years? But we can only do this by knowing things like this. And with additive manufacturing, with new technologies, opportunities coming to actually design these implants specific to an individual's biomechanical characteristics. And so currently, as and when you end up with an operation, there are a series of components that are in stock that are a certain size. So much like you going to buy a new pair of shoes. You go in, you have your feet measured, and they get off the shelf a pair of shoes that are a size that is as close uh, as your existing uh, foot sizes as possible. But it's never going to be a perfect fit. There's always going to be some movement between your foot and the shoe because it's not custom made. That's one of the limitations that people are beginning to realize with the hip, the knee, um, and other joints as well. Where we're getting implants off the shelf, inherently there are some limitations. It's probable that you end up with one hip that's a different size than the other hip. Unless you're very fortunate and you go into a, uh, into a hospital and there happens to be an exact match in terms of size for the hip that you've already got. If you have two different hip sizes, left and right, that's inevitably going to have a consequence in terms of how you move. It might only be a subtle consequence. It might indeed be a consequence that's very difficult to measure given the measuring techniques that we've got at the minute. We go back to, to day one and we recall effectively on bony prominences how one of the methods of measuring is to attach some reflective balls to the most protruding parts of your skeleton. And these reflective balls enable us computationally to join dots up. The real value is when you can join a dot with equivalent dots on the other side of a joint. So here, you can measure the joint angle of the hip. And indeed, you'd be able to measure the joint angle of the knee as well. Currently, that's pretty much our gold standard for measuring how people move. And so, when it comes to us assessing biomechanically the performance of new hips, new knees, we're beholden to this technology. But this technology has inherent limitations. 
these balls are in some way attached to the outside surface of your skin. It's of no surprise that the skin is moving differently to your bones. You can feel that merely by moving the skin on your wrist. You can move the skin on your wrist and your bones don't go anywhere. And so it's quite conceivable that these markers are actually moving relative to the bones that they're trying to represent. And so our super accurate systems are actually giving us an answer in degrees, plus or minus an unknown quantity. And there's not an awful lot we can do to improve our ability to measure. Talking to your colleagues over in the week, using these kind of systems to, to monitor cricket players to see how accurate their technique is and how compliant their techniques are. One of the problems is that you need your participants to warm up. You can't try and assess a cricket technique with somebody who walked in um, cold off the street. And so by the time you've got someone to warm up, the skin is sweaty. By the time you then come to attach balls onto a sweaty person, it's even harder to get a good attachment. You then ask them to run and to bowl, and quite commonly you end up with balls rolling all over the floor. And so you're trying to make very fine measurements based on an imperfect system to try and make very subtle improvements to increase this. And so to a certain extent, we're limited by the quality of this data. And that's potentially hindering our ability to properly or to effectively apply technologies such as additive manufacturing, where in theory, the geometry of your hip could be scanned. And then a perfect replica of your healthy hip could be manufactured. So you'd have a joint of identical science. This would then presumably have advantages that are perhaps outside of the ability of the common methods of measuring to detect. But when it comes to us trying to leave a greater performance than this, and we have an ability to economically or, or reasonably economically manufacture one-off items, bespoke items, then it seems that our ability to accurately assess what's happening in the joint, to accurately measure what's happening in the joint, currently is a little bit limited. And it might be these experimental limitations that are preventing the field from moving forward and making progress. One of the well-cited groups from Germany, uh, they've actually put strain gauges into their implants. And so if you were to consider uh, a knee joint, if we look again crudely from the side, we effectively have that with a stem that goes into the femur. And the Bergman group have on the back surface attached some strain gauges. And then in here, they've had a power supply and uh, an antenna as well. And so, that gives them the capability to start measuring what's happening in the joint itself. And so rather than having to do this and do this, which again has quite clear limitations, they can start measuring joint reaction forces live in patients. That's not necessarily immediately going to add value to the ability to design patient-specific implants, because by the time you've got a knee implant in, it's too late to assess the joint reaction force and design a solution specific to it. But it's constantly improving the resolution of the understanding and picture that we have of what's happening within our lower leg. And that's the, the real important driver here. The work from Bergman continues. Um, it was highly cited in um, a lot of the uh, biomechanics conferences and won a lot of prizes because of its value that it gave to the community. But there's still scope to improve. That required uh, 
uh, a battery and an antenna, and it was implanted into a very small number of patients as a consequence. But with emerging technologies in sensing and instrumentation, then there's opportunity to try and find some way of interfacing a wireless um, implant, maybe with mobile phones. So you can record your own data as you walk around. And it's that level of clarity, that level of data and understanding that we need of how the current HIPs work to give us a better appreciation as to how the next generation of hips and knees can be designed. And this highlights the value of such studies. We're talking here about using force platforms that we would find typically in a motion analysis lab. And so that's a, um, a platform that's in, in essence hidden in the floor so that you don't appreciate when you're walking on it. And we use these platforms to try and determine the difference between a patient and their behavior preoperatively with that behavior postoperatively. And so we know the performance and the characteristics of a person when they're healthy as a normal subject. And by collecting data, we can compare the preoperative behavior with the postoperative behavior. And again, this has value. It adds to the, the wealth of data and knowledge that we have of how our implants are performing. And we can track the relative progression of post-operative patients as they get back to what we expect to be normal. And we can do this in different groups to measure the speed by which they return to normal based on the different implants that they have. And so one of the current problems that we see is that whilst there's a rigorous accreditation and approval process to get new implants accepted onto the market, our ability to be confident that these implants are going to work is still inherently limited. So if we were to design a new hip joint ourselves, we would have to go through um, wear simulations. And so these would be put into machines that would effectively try and replicate what would happen in the human body. And they'll be moved through millions of cycles and in essence, you're trying to measure the amount of wear that happens. That's the failure mechanism here. There's, there's little um, pain per se, because there's uh, a metal covering, um, at least on uh, the femoral head. There'll be a plastic covering in the acetabulum. So were we as engineers to try and come up with a new intervention, then we'd have to go through a series of tests to include wear testing. But that wear testing only shows us so much. Why? Because the motion that our wear testing machine does is repeated. It does the same thing over and over again. And we know that that's never a true reflection of how these things behave or are used uh, in the body. And a sign of a successful device is the mass of wear particles that have been collected or the change in mass of your original components. And so you're after the minimal change in mass because that means you've had minimal wear. But these tests only tell you so much. Animal tests only tell you so much. The time that you really get data is through studies such as this where you can start to see the clinical measurable change in, um, in biomechanics that we can compare one design with another. Perhaps one of the most infamous engineering issues of orthopedics up to, to now was that the metal on metal hip joints. 
kind of abbreviated to MOM. Engineers quite reasonably thought that in order to minimize wear of a joint, and so maximize the length of its use, you want to go for the hardest possible materials that the body would reasonably accept, such, such that you minimize wear. And so the idea was to have a metal ball and a metal cup interfacing with each other. And so the likelihood is that you've got two hard materials and so you're going to reduce wear. From an engineering perspective, you can get metal surfaces to be very smooth, relatively. And so when we come back to our concept of biotribology yesterday, where we're in essence dealing with the ability to separate two surfaces, the smoother you can get those two surfaces, the easier it is to get total separation. So by using a metal cup and a metal ball, you can machine these to very fine surface roughnesses. And so 20, 30 years ago, that all sounded very sensible. And so metal, metal hips were quite commonplace. They were implanted throughout patients who needed new hips. But only very recently has the engineering downside of these um, devices been realized that whilst the wear particles aren't huge in terms of quantity, they're quite toxic to the body. And so because of the surrounding tissues that effectively cover and encapsulate the hip joint, wear particles are being produced, getting trapped within it, escalating the creation of further wear particles, and they were starting to accumulate in the surrounding soft tissues. And it was found that such an accumulation of metal ions uh, in the body was really quite undesirable, um, to the extent that these have now been stopped um, without question. So metal, metal is now not used at all. Um, and there are various uh, cases that are ongoing of patients and clinicians um, being or challenging manufacturers um, in terms of compensations and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so these studies have great value. We're trying to understand how joints um, perform. And the reason that we need to understand how joints perform feeds into all this kind of stuff, all the stuff that engineers um, can actually influence. And of course, we can't influence this on our own. We need to work closely with orthopedic surgeons uh, because they are our end users. They are the people that will actually implement the products that we design. And that's probably a good place to stop for now, for a short break. Are there any questions that are relatively easy to answer from anyone? I think you're going to be asked to say that again with a microphone. Uh, hello. Uh, in the case of natural joints, uh, the degree of freedom uh, can be controlled by uh, our need. But in the case of implant designing, how can we account this problem? Uh, so, what, what, so in terms of, so how can we? It means uh, this is the joint. Uh -huh. So, if I want to move this hand by uh, two newton force, then we can move. And if you want to restrict that up to twenty newton, we can restrict. But if you want to imp uh, design a impl uh, design implant, uh, then how can we account this problem? Okay. Um I think I understand what you mean, or maybe I don't. So if I if I talk about something totally different, then tell me to stop and I'll 
try again. Um, so you're asking how we, it did come down to feel and pain. I, I don't understand how you're saying that you could. Yes, yep. OK, so in terms of this, which are now a rather tired looking picture of a hip. Um, so we control that in exactly the same way as you control your own hip, insofar as all the muscles that are in your hip now remain intact. And so the only thing we're taking out is our hip joint, so our femoral head, and making a new cup. And so these aren't things that you would naturally control anyway. You would obviously control now in, in a healthy um, state, you would control how much and how far your arm moves and your leg moves. Um, these devices are passive. And so they are in essence operating exactly the same way as your existing knee or hip. And so you might be able to feel that they're there, although that's unlikely. You might be able to hear that they're there because at times they've been known to squeak. Um, but in terms of changing how you move as a consequence of them being there, there is no difference. So it's not as if you have lost all feeling of your lower leg as a consequence of that operation. Um, it's effectively a like-for-like -like replacement. And so your, your hip at the minute, which you don't do anything really to control, um, is taken out and a new one's put in. And so if you, if you were to get up and walk again after a, a knee or a hip uh, replacement, then you would be um, uh, you would be slow to walk at first. That's not because you've forgotten how to walk. That's because of the swelling, um, confidence, and, and perhaps a bit of pain as well. Um, and so it's not as if you would need to relearn any skill, um, because so long as the operation is successful, then your nerves would remain uh, intact and your muscles would, would remain intact as well. And so this is. This is very different to, for example, a, uh, a, an arm prosthesis, where if you had an arm prosthesis or a leg prosthesis, you would be looking to, in some way, control the movement of that, that new limb. Um, but in this situation, we don't need to do that because your body still works as it did, but it would function around this new, um, new joint. One of the issues with Prostheses is being able to control what they do. Um, and that's where we come into this world of how do you translate um, nerve impulses from the, the stump to the, the rest of your new leg. Um, and so that is when you want an active prosthesis, um, one that responds to uh, essentially what you want it to do. Um, with this level of implant, or certainly the, the functionality that's demanded of this implant, there's no need for it to do anything other than passively sit there and, and effectively do what you tell it to. Um, so there's a subtle difference between what we're talking about here and what you would want a full replacement of the leg um, to be able to achieve. Does that answer the question? Maybe not. I guess you could, if you wanted to. Uh, I mean, you could, for example, the constraints of the knee, in essence, the knee is a hinge joint. 
Now, now you could take out the hinge joint and replace it with a ball and socket, and so you could deliberately alter the um, degrees of freedom in the knee, and so you could have a knee that would move um, kind of round and left and right as it would do front and back. Uh, and so you, you could change the knee deliberately if you wanted to, um, but the, that would be unwise because the, the ligaments of the knee are supporting, are, are designed to support the knee to have certain range of motion and degrees of freedom. Um, and so if you were to replace the conventional hinge joint or hinge joint-like um, knee with a hip joint-like knee, um, then you would find your patient very quickly falls over because the, the ligaments of the knee aren't stable enough to stop that from happening. So you would design your new implant to uh, closely match the geometry of the healthy joint because that's ultimately the constraints that you're trying to design to fit within. Um, so predominantly the ligaments and the other connective tissues you're, you're trying to retain um, such that you can as close as possible match the, the functionality of the of the healthy joints. No, so a static analysis is quite um, straightforward to do. So it goes back to, um, I guess, high school mechanics insofar as, and that's not to undermine your question at all, but that's to say that we're treating the human body as a, a mechanical system. Um, and that gives us some information. Um, it's, it, you wouldn't go off to an orthopedic company and say you've got the best design ever based on a static analysis because there is inherent limitation to the analysis that that enables you to do. But equally, it's a useful tool to provide some initial data. Um, and you can, as you say, by, by having body weight in there, you can do a simple study of people in your class, for example. So you can look at the likely different joint reaction forces across a, a range of different people. And so it's, it's a tool to give you a basic appreciation of what's happening in a joint. Um, it would enable you to assess certain parameters reasonably well, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't use it to do an extensive scientific study, for example. Um, and so it, it has value, but you need to be aware of the limitations of that value. Uh, we, I think it's probably in the earliest slides. Um, it's probably easy to take it from the slides because it, it's, it's gone in, in notes and also the vectors will be the right length. If I had to try and do it by hand on the board, then you've seen my quality of drawing. Um, it would never match up because my vectors would be the wrong length. And so um, have a look in the earlier notes, um, the ones from Monday, and they're in there. Yeah, but that I will send them basically. Yep. Yes. Um, there is, and there is, it's a big problem. Um, the reason I hesitate is it's probably something that, yeah, would need a clean board. Where's my, where's my wiper? See if we can recycle this. It's one of the big problems, is how do you maintain stability in the knee? And it's not, it's not purely about just a mechanical stress concentration. Uh, what have we got? Okay, so hopefully that's relatively clear. So you can, um, so we're back to this. And so your, your question is, here we have our metallic component. Here we have our nice soft internal bone and then the cortical bone outside. And so my understanding of your question is that you're saying what happens where you have a stiff metallic implant 
and you have bone, um, you're going to presumably get stress concentration somewhere. So much like we talked about the tendon and the bone interfacing with one another, the body is designed in such a way to try and mitigate that stress concentration as far as possible. The issue here is not so much about um, catastrophic failure. So we're not talking about a risk of the metallic component failing through wear in terms of the, the stem because it's, it's too thick, too strong. We're not really talking about the bone from failing across its length because that is, is also too strong. It's strong enough to withstand um, the movement. One of the issues that we do get though is what we call toggling. And so that is that the, if we remove that for the time being, that you have your loading coming through here and your reaction force coming up here. So we've got, in essence, a bending moment of the two. And I'll go without black. And so we have a distance of, of about that. And it causes, or could cause, the femoral stem to, to, to wobble or to toggle in the, the bone itself. And it's probably that which is the greatest cause of stress um, as opposed to the difference in the materials. And so how do you stop the risk of that happening? There are a few questions that people generally use. And so do you have a collar? So that is at the top of the bone, do you put a design feature like that around the top of the femur to stop it from sliding further into the bone? Do you use cement? So do we have an area around the base of the, the uh, femoral stem that is cemented into place or not? So do you physically add some adhesive such that there's a chemical bond between the two? If you don't use cement, So the alternative there is not a collar. Um, if you don't use cement, then the alternative here is to encourage bone ingrowth. And so you would add a coating to the uh, stem to encourage the bone to grow into it. And so both of those scenarios are, are trying to mitigate or trying to minimize the risk of a stress concentration. Because if if you do have movement up here, then you're going to have greater movement down here. And ultimately, if you get movement down here, then you're going to have cell necrosis, which equals cell death. If the, the cells at the bottom are under too much strain, they'll start to die. And so, Whereas you want this to be as stable as possible, we need this to be stable because we can't have any movement up here, any wobbling up here. Obviously we have movement as they slide past one another, but it's, it's got to stay still. If we have any cell death at the bottom, that's gonna encourage the bottom bit to start to wobble slightly, to start, start to move slightly when it's, when it's loaded. Which means that up here, we're gonna have movement as well. And so, the key thing is to stop or to minimize any stress concentration at the bottom here. And so you could have a collar to stop the, the stem sliding in. But do you add cement? Do you encourage the bone to grow onto it? Um, one of the design features that's, I guess, accepted now is the fact that the, the femoral stem um, becomes slimmer at the bottom so that the material is less stiff and the difference between stiffness um, of the bone and um, the, uh, the stem itself is, is a lot less. And so you're, you're trying to uh, normalize the stiffness or, or make the stiffness as comparable as possible. So in answer to your question, that's, that's really quite an important concept. And um, one of the other issues that we've talked about, and it's not as prevalent here um, as it could be, is that because we have our thick, rigid metal stem in the middle of our bone, and we try as best we can 
to make this as thin as possible, to minimize stress uh, concentrations, there is still going to be a difference between the stress here and, most importantly, in this part of the bone, because a lot of the stress and a lot of the load in the bone is actually being taken by the stem and not the bone itself. And then the stress where the bone or where the stem doesn't reach to. And so here, the stem is absorbing some of the stress, and so the bone doesn't need to. Here, and the region beyond the tip of the stem, there is no metal component to absorb any of the load, and so it all has to be absorbed by the bone. Up here, we have something called stress shielding, and so we touched on that earlier in the week. And that is that the bone actually becomes a bit weaker because load is transferred through the metallic component instead. So we have a weak bit of bone. We have bone of consistent strength. And this is more the issue in terms of a stress concentration. It has nothing directly to do with the implant itself. It's more to do with the change in stress or the, the difference in stress that you get as a consequence, an indirect consequence of the implant being in place. And it's this interface, the end of the bone, uh, the end of the implant rather, and, and the beginning of purely bone, that gives rise to something that is called periprosthetic fracture. And so that's a, a real concern of all engineers in the, in the area, is how do you mitigate against periprosthetic fracture? So your hip implant might actually be really good, but your perhaps typically elderly lady who has osteoporosis and so relatively weak bones anyway, if they fall over, first time they fall over, they'll fracture their, the neck of their femur, and so they need a new hip replacement. Next time they fall over, they might well fracture here instead because of this increased risk of periprosthetic fracture. And so at that point, it could be that they need a bone plate instead. And this isn't really what you want. In fact, this isn't at all what you want from elderly patients who are likely to be at greater risk of anesthetic, for example, who don't have the core strength to withstand major surgery. And so however we can avoid this from happening, then we should continue to try to, to find such solutions. Make sense? Hmm. Yes, so that is probably as a consequence of the metal metal stuff. So certainly the metal metal stuff, I think the risks of the buildup of metallic ions um, in high concentration near the, the hips in particular um, were associated with the, an increased risk of cancer. So that's probably, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so that's why the use of a metallic head and a metallic cup has been stopped um, because people didn't appreciate the potential risk at first because when you do these wear-based studies in a machine, um, appreciating that is, is difficult. And whilst you can quantify the amount of um, wear that happens in the, uh, in the components, because you either measure the mass of them before and after, or you filter the lubricant afterwards to pick out all the wear particles, so you can quantify the amount of wear that's happening. And the amount of wear looks very promising versus uh, an equivalent design with a plastic cup. So the plastic is a lot softer, um, and so wears a lot faster. And so when you look at the quantity of wear in a metal-on-metal -metal design versus a metal-on-plastic design, this is, is far more favorable. And so at the time, engineers and surgeons thought the, the, an advantage of this technique was um, reduced wear. And so they, they went ahead and implanted uh, a significant number. Now it's only starting to be appreciated that Whilst you do get relatively little wear, the clinical consequence of that wear of those wear particles is is, is extreme, and it can lead in some cases to cancer or risk of cancer. Yeah. 
Um, which is why the metal metal implants have now been stopped, um, why there are calls for some patients to have them removed and replaced, um, but that in itself is a fairly dramatic procedure. Given that we're becoming quite good at integrating the, the stem with the bone, the downside is trying to get the stem out again is increasingly challenging. And these modular systems have limitations. Ideally, you'd put a stem in and then you'd fit the, the ball on top. There are a number of designs that do that as a consequence of knowing that sometimes a femoral head needs to be replaced, but not all designs do that. And so there'll be some way you, you have to physically try and wrestle the, the femoral stem back out of the femur. So absolutely, the metal metal is, um, appears to be a very good engineering solution. Um, it indeed is a very good engineering solution in terms of measuring purely for wear quantity, but the consequence of those relatively few wear particles um, wasn't fully understood and couldn't really be fully understood by doing simulations because you just can't measure the... the... Um, yes, um, but there would be a... You would be operating against an inertia in the community now that is quite fearful of metal. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't be used, uh, and indeed, hips currently, that the ball is still metal, um, but you have the cup as being plastic. In a knee, the condyles are metal, the tibial plateau, the tray is plastic. Um, and that's done because you know that where you have um, a soft material, in this case plastic, the wear particles from that interaction will be generated from the plastic and not from the metal, i.e. that the plastic will wear out first. Um, and it's okay to have an accumulation of plastic particles because the body doesn't reject those. The issue is that the increased rate of wear of plastic components means that they need to be replaced a lot sooner. So these give us better lifetime, better lifespan in terms of the length that they uh, remain functional. Um, but the risk of the metallic ions being um, harmful to the body if we have a plastic and a metal component, which we can have in either here or here, um, it's not known to be rejected by the body or not, not known to cause the body risk, um, but they wear out faster. Um, the, the other solution on the table, certainly for hips, is ceramic. And so you can have a ceramic on ceramic. One of the problems there is that ceramics are notoriously brittle. And so you end up with a risk of, of early um, catastrophic failure of a, a brittle um, failure of the, of the material. Um, but it might be that ceramics are um, end up being the, the, the field of um, preference for, for hips in particular. For knees, they're limited because the geometries are a lot thinner. Um, and so to have the complex shape, the, the shape's not necessarily a problem, but it's the relatively thin um, curved components of the knee which would make a ceramic knee um, challenging at the minute. Yeah, um, so I'll just recover my pen. Um, so the, the plastic implants, um, I'll sacrifice my picture, I'll start again. So the plastic implants are polyethylene. And plastic on plastic wouldn't work because it would wear out too soon. And so you have to twin plastic with something else. And so if we look, for example, at a knee, so if we have our... Start again, that's not a particularly good picture of a knee. So a healthy knee looks something like that. We have our menisci in here as well. And you can see why I don't want to do those vectors because my pictures aren't brilliant. So that's how our knee starts out as. When a surgeon comes in, they use some uh, cutting guides. And so depending on, so there are a number of companies making plants. Um, the hospital or the doctor would have a certain agreement with a certain company to supply them with knees and hips and, and everything else. 
And that company would supply some specific cutting guides on jigs. So much like the, the technicians in the workshop would perhaps use a jig to make a, a certain cut in a, a certain piece of material, uh, a surgeon uses a similar thing. So they um, effectively bolt the jig on in the right place. And in essence, they're going to be taking um, a slice off the top of the tibia. So we have our, our new tibia. They would put first a metal plate. So there'd be a tibial tray. And then on top of that, they would then put a plastic bearing surface. And so that's our plastic. And this is um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And orthopedics now uses cross-linked um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. So that is a tougher variety or derivation of the standard material. And so that becomes our bearing surface. And our knee is replaced with a metallic surface that wraps around underneath it as well. So here we have metallic condyles. And this is one unit that actually links together back here. And our metallic condyles will sit on our plastic tray. The wear properties here, again, are very similar to the hip, where you'd end up with the, um, the tibial component wearing out first because it's softer and um, because of its plastic nature. It's not unheard of effectively to, to wear through the tibial uh, component. Um, and at that point, you clearly need a new, uh, a new implant. Um, but that would be the kind of the construction of a, a knee. If we were to look at a hip, In terms of plastics, then we would cut off the femoral head. That would be replaced by a metallic head. And our cup would be replaced by a plastic liner that then fits with inside a metal construction. So we've got a metal cup that's screwed into the pelvis. And then we have a liner that push fits into the metal cup. And then the ball sits within the cup and the ligaments um, hold the, the hip or the femur into place. So that's predominantly where um, we see plastic being used at the minute. Perhaps the one exception is if we look at the, the hand and our finger joints are obviously a lot smaller. Um, you can get wearing out of the finger joints. When that happens, the probably most common cause of, or the most common solution at the minute is to remove both parts of the uh, fingers, and to replace that then with a solution that looks something like that. So it's a one-piece joint. 
Um, and so that's a plasticky type joint as well. And so they're the main kind of uses of plastics within implants at the minute. So that's in the finger. Answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> I need some rest. I need some rest. So, do they have the 